When I'm picking a new research topics and new, new areas to explore, uh, generally, I, I have a general interest in trying to understand human behavior and particularly political behavior. So when I started really getting into political science research, I found what most fascinated me was understanding uh, where people's political opinions originate from, whether they're stable or not, how they, what causes them to change over time if they change. So I think I just have an inherent interest in understanding um, political behavior, but particularly opinion formation. Uh, from there, then, I am just, uh, I think that from there, real world phenomena then, then enter into play. So when thinking about where public's where the public opinions come from, why some people are tolerant of, of groups like the Ku Klux Klan and why others might not be. Uh, in thinking through the variety of sources that might influence opinions, you can't help but think about the mass media because a lot of what individuals know about politics they learn through the news media and through other media sources. So I think starting from a basic assumption, a basic goal to understand human behavior uh, and opinion formation, and then I was drawn into the media to try to get a sense of whether the news media have a strong influence uh, on, uh, on opinions or whether they don't and if the influence is a little more nuanced to try to explore and determine what, what that might be. Issue framing is the process by which uh, an individual or group constructs an issue. So in thinking about political issues, most are very complex and there are many different ways you could think about an issue. So for example, a civil liberties controversy, you might be drawn to thinking about it as essentially about free speech, essentially about the characteristics of the group that wants, that wants to speak, essentially about the involvement of protesters, or essentially about the possibility that it could erupt into some kind of violence or public disorder. Um, and so in thinking about the issue, you can be drawn to various characteristics and features of that particular issue or event. Framing is the process by which you're essentially constructing the issue and saying this issue is about free speech or this issue is about public order. And it draws the attention to whoever you're communicating to. It draws their attention to some features of the issue and ignores implicitly, uh, explicitly actually, would ignore other features of the issue. In thinking about um, issue framing uh, and the way in which frames that the news media present may or may not impact the public's opinions, um, my co-authors and I had a strong sense that civil liberties controversies are ripe for framing, in part because civil liberties controversies often involve uh, a clashing of core values. So when you think about whether you want to attend a uh, KKK rally or whether you want to uh, allow the KKK to actually have a protest or a rally, uh, you may be drawn to free speech. That's a core value in American politics. Of course, most people, certainly in the abstract, say they support free speech. But you might also be concerned about public order, whether there would be some public disruption, whether violence might, uh, might occur, either because of what the members of the KKK are doing or saying, or because counter-protesters might appear. So in terms of seeing whether uh, news framing, the news construction presentation of issue might impact public opinion, uh, we thought it would be really interesting to explore a controversy, again, where you have two values that may just hit head on, and values that in the abstract most Americans say they're going to support. So by the news covering, if news stations uh, could cover this issue highlighting one of the values as opposed to the other, does that mean that the public may be more or less supportive of the KKK? So if the news coverage repeatedly focuses on the free speech rights of members of the KKK as well as the free speech rights of members who want to go listen uh, to, uh, to the KKK or maybe counter protesters, then we might expect tolerance towards the KKK activities would be quite high compared to if the news media decided to focus on the fact that there might be public disruption, there may have to be uh, lots of money spent to hire police officers, uh, working overtime to protect the crowds, those sorts of things. So. Trying to 
determine whether the news media or any type of media impact opinions or behavior of the public, it turns out to be rather tricky. Uh, you can ask individuals their opinions toward a variety of issues um, and then maybe ask them if they've seen the news on the same topic and then you think you might be able to think you could draw some conclusions. People that saw coverage of a certain issue uh, then have a certain opinion versus those that didn't see coverage. Um, but you can't actually be certain whether exactly if they did watch the news on the issue exactly what they learned, um, whether they were exposed to information on the topic and other means. So one of the best ways to determine whether news media can impact opinions is through experimentation. One of the uh, components of experimentation is researcher control. So you, and that means actually a couple of things. One is that researchers control whether individuals are exposed to something or not exposed to. In the case of media effects, you control whether someone's exposed to a news story or they're not exposed to a news story. Um, in addition, you might have different variations on a news story. So you create variations or you use variations on the news story and expose some individuals to one version of a story and some to another version of a story. Uh, now this should sound familiar to you because it's very similar. Uh, that process is exactly essential to medical drug trials. So if you want to determine if a certain drug is going to have the health benefits that you expect, you cannot draw any firm conclusions if you give the drug to a number of people and just see what happens. What you need to do is expose some individuals to the drug, expose other individuals to not to the drug, generally to a placebo, uh, and then you look to see for the, you measure the health response that you're trying to that you assume the drug will create. And if in fact those that received the drug had the desired health response and those that received the placebo did not, uh, then you can conclude and that there's some causal effect, the drug caused the reaction. It's really the same when you use experimentation in the social sciences and in political science. Exposure of individuals to, in this case, a media story, and then you look at their attitudes and behavior, ask them some questions, measure, measure those, and you examine whether the people who were exposed to one news story have a different set of attitudes than those who are exposed to a different news story. Once we had uh, decided that we wanted to examine news media framing around a civil liberties controversy, uh, and this had been a goal of ours for some time, and in quite a stroke of luck for us, uh, it was announced, the KKK announced that they would be holding a series of rallies um, in, uh, in southern Ohio and actually in some other Midwestern towns. We then started to tape the local news. Uh, we were hoping, we didn't really know how the local news would be covering and presenting these rallies, uh, but we taped the news, we looked at the news stories, we ended up with probably about half a dozen news stories covering different events. And fortunately for us, one event that happened in a small county south of Columbus, Ohio, two local news stations, opted to cover the same event using very different news narrative stories frames and exactly picking up on the values that we thought they would um, in part because again they're, they're important values that are inherent in these civil liberties controversies. So one station emphasized really the free speech component of the rally. They showed the KKK members um, speaking, they showed protesters speaking, uh, counter-protesters uh, with signs that say things like no free speech for racists. The interviews that they chose to put into the story were all of individuals who said that they, they came because they wanted to hear what the KKK had to say. Another local news station, using, by the way, some of the same exact footage, or very similar footage, chose to package the elements of their story around a public order narrative. So they emphasize the, uh, not only the potential disruption, but one man held up a metal bolt that uh, someone had thrown at him. There were images of uh, police that were there to make sure that both sides were relatively peaceful. So. Much to our delight, these local news stations took the same issue, the same exact event, but framed them in very different ways. We then embedded these news stories uh, within a slightly longer uh, newscast. That is, we used some other uh, footage from the local news stations and put it in a commercial. Uh, the preliminary stories were exactly the same for everyone, but then half of our participants in our study saw the free speech version of the news frame, and then half of them viewed the public order version of the news frame. 
after that, they completed a survey and we asked them, among other things, whether they would support the right of the KKK to protest and to rally. And we also uh, included some other questions so we could try to determine if the media frames impacted levels of tolerance, what kind of mental processing was going on to produce that result. After we completed the study and we were looking at the results, the one of the main goals uh, that we were, the main hypotheses that we were testing, uh, we found pretty strong support for. So there are participants that saw the free speech frame version of the story uh, had much higher levels of tolerance, significantly higher levels of tolerance, were more willing to say, yeah, the KKK should be able to hold rallies uh, than the individuals that saw the public order version of the frame. So that impact of the various versions of the stories on public opinion, precisely what we expected to find. We did some further analyses to try to determine why it is that the frames had the effect on tolerance. And one thing we did was ask individuals how important certain considerations, certain pieces of information were as they were thinking about whether to allow the KKK to hold rallies or not. Uh, and among these considerations were public order concerns and free speech concerns. We expected that those that watched the free, saw the free speech story would could think free speech considerations were more important in determining levels of tolerance and therefore would be more tolerant of the KKK and the same mechanism for a public order. What we found, surprisingly, was that that mechanism only worked for public order concerns. So regardless of whether people saw the free speech version of the public order version of the story, they're equally likely to say that free speech is important. When you're thinking about should the KKK rally, yeah, free speech is an important consideration. Uh, but it was only those that saw the public order version of the story that thought public order was significantly important. Uh, and it was really that through that mechanism that we saw the results um, impacting tolerance. In retrospect, we maybe shouldn't have been surprised because free speech is an important value in this society. And so, that the notion that free speech is important perhaps is always relatively high and that's not going to vary by what news story that you happen to see. But there was some variation on the public order importance. Political discussions and political debates are full of frames. Uh, and in fact, one of the I think most successful rhetorical strategies for individuals engaging in a policy debate, particularly politicians, is to try to frame the issue, construct the issue in a way that supports the outcome that you want. So I would argue that almost any issue, almost any discussion, almost any debate, uh, we'll, we'll see framing, we'll see evidence of framing uh, among elected officials, uh, politicians, and oftentimes the de policy debate is really a debate over wh which frame is going to win, which frame is going to be the one that gets the most traction, has the most public support, as well as has the most support among, uh, among the decision makers. So o almost any issue I could see that happening, the recent healthcare reform debate, for example, uh, was really in part a struggle over how important is it to provide health insurance and health care to Americans who currently don't have any versus things like uh, whether the government should become more involved in health care decisions, size of government. Just Those were just a couple of the competing frames in that debate. For most policy issues, they're actually competing frames. And so to determine whether framing is going to impact public opinion, you need to figure out which, which frames are, are out there, which are being put forth, which ones are being covered by the news media, which ones are actually um, th then have the opportunity for, public, for the public to learn about. There are other issues, though, where really one frame sort of dominates. Uh, and a good example of that would be discussion of civil liberties um, in the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, where national security concerns and protecting the homeland became the dominant frame. It became the frame that most government officials were putting out. It also was the frame that resonated most with the American public in the immediate aftermath, as well as for, for at least a couple of years after that. So those that were opposed to restricting civil liberties in the wake of 9-11 had a very hard time breaking through and getting their frame to resonate with the public and actually to be heard and to get it covered in the news media. So in sometimes some debates, one, one side, one frame will be heavily dominant 
for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but most of politics is actually it's a process of competing frames where both sides are trying to, again, trying to win, trying to get their side uh, to win their, their side of the policy proposal. Um, and they're trying to determine the, the most appropriate frame to do so. Uh, in the future, I have a couple of projects in mind exploring public opinion, uh, and one actually is related to this framing work. I'm quite interested in exploring whether media attention to political issues in kind of a strategic frame. So policy debates are often presented by the media in terms of the, the politics and the strategies engaged in getting legislation passed. Uh, Health care reform debate of late, for example, uh, the, lots of coverage was about whether Obama had uh, any hope of getting Republicans on board, whether some Republicans were interested, whether he could keep the Democratic coalition together. Uh, and, and lots of sort of political maneuvering, strategic maneuvering, dominated news coverage. Less attention was played to this, paid to the substance of the policy proposal. So what exactly will this health care reform bill do if enacted? So this difference between strategic and substantive framing of an issue is uh, important in contemporary media coverage of politics and I think probably has important implications on public opinion formation. So that, that's one area that I want to focus on. It's a slightly different notion of framing in the sense that, but it more squarely focuses on the media, how the media are choosing to cover policy debates. Uh, the other area of public opinion that I want to focus on now isn't related to framing at all, but it focuses, uh, I want to focus on new media, particularly the internet and cable, net, and, cable uh, and the expansion of sources for political news and whether that has any implications or has that any effects on levels of public knowledge. So you can imagine a scenario where more news outlets, uh, more easily accessible news outlets could lead to a public that's more informed and more knowledgeable on who the important players are uh, in, in current politics, what the big events are, what the main issues are, knowing about the issues. Uh, my preliminary exploration suggests that that's not the case, in fact, that public uh, levels, pl uh, knowledge levels of politics have not risen as the number, variety, and accessibility of news sources have exploded. When I started college, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but I thought I needed to say what I wanted to do, so I told everyone I wanted to go to law school. Uh, I think I was attracted by legal dramas um, and this notion that um, I could try to maybe solve crimes and try to figure things out. Uh, and I was always interested in taking courses about politics and government. I found myself taking courses that had nothing to do with the law. Uh, which was probably the first signal that law school wasn't for me. I didn't know what was for me. Uh, I would kind of worried approaching my, I approached my senior year not knowing what I was going to do after graduation and that had me kind of worried, had my parents worried. Uh, and then I started my senior thesis. And what I learned was that I loved the process of t picking a topic that seemed fascinating to me, reading about the topic, exploring the topic, collecting some new information. Um, so I, I examined um, Democratic Party attempts to win back the White House. This was before the 1992 election. Uh, so I loved it. I had a great time um, exploring the topic. I thought, I think I could do this. I could think I could have a career out of this. Um, I didn't know, however, uh, about the process of graduate school uh, until my advisor saw that I was getting really quite interested in political science. She thought perhaps that that might be a good career choice to me. She did what she could to convince people not to go to law school and to think about political science instead. So she was the one that really explained to me the process about graduate school, helped me understand what it was like to be a professor, uh, the teaching end, but also the research end, and how both of those components were very important to the job. Um, so it's really due to her that I understood the process, um, but it was my fascination with, with doing my own research and really trying to understand and being able to address questions and topics that I found just very fascinating, very interesting. I think there are a number of ways that political science research is quite relevant, um, and I'll probably just give a couple examples from my research areas. Uh, I study public opinion. 
And I think what public opinion research that political scientists have conducted helps is testing people's assumptions about the capabilities of the public. So you, you might hear people say, oh, the public, they don't know anything about certain policy issues, or how can they make informed decisions about who should be uh, president, who should be the leaders of the country? And whether these assumptions are actually well-founded and well-grounded or not is something that political science research can help illuminate. Uh, so yes, political scientists have learned that maybe levels of knowledge among the public aren't incredibly high. Um, well, they're not, you know, people don't know political facts at maybe, you know, 80 or 100 percent of the public. But, but actually when you sit down and talk to individuals, they have a pretty good grasp of what government should do, um, what they would prefer government do, what, where they get unhappy with government. Uh, and I think political scientists have been able to illuminate the capabilities of the public when it comes to democratic governance, which is important, I think, in assessing it's important for leaders to know that when they're trying to figure out what role the public should play uh, in, in policy making. But it also helps just if sort of thinking about more democratic normative standards, what role should the public play in a society, in a, in a democratic society. Uh, and political science research, I think empirical research, helps to get some currency uh, on questions like that.